Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Jennifer Cargill from Dallas, Texas. Dr. Jennifer Cargill is an assistant professor in the Department of Plastic Surgery at the UD Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Cargill is a section chief of plastic surgery and director of hand surgery at the VA North Texas Healthcare System. Dr. Cargill earned her medical degree and completed a residency in plastic surgery at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, Texas. She received advanced training in hand surgery and microsurgery through a fellowship at the UD Southwestern Medical School. Certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery in both plastic surgery and hand surgery, she joined the UD Southwestern faculty in the year 2014. Dr. Cargill is an active member in local, regional, and national professional organizations, such as the Texas Society of Plastic Surgeons, the Texas Medical Association, the Texas and Dallas County Medical Society, the American Society of Plastic Surgery, and the American Association of Hand Surgery. She serves on multiple local committees that focus on faculty diversity, inclusion, wellness, and development. She's delivered numerous presentations locally, regionally, and nationally, and has several publications to her credit. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Jennifer Cargo from Dallas, Texas. Over to you, Jen. Thank you so much, and thank you for a, a lovely introduction and the opportunity to give this talk. Um, so today, I'm actually going to be talking about something that we call zebras and hand surgery. <clears throat> and just to kind of clarify for people what that means, because it may not always translate into um, uh, other areas, these kind of uh, English idioms. Uh, when we talk about zebras, we say, we tell our residents, you know, don't look for the zebras when you should be focusing on the horses. And that's basically to say that horses are much more common. So think about common things, all common things being common rather than going off on tangents to try and find these obscure diagnoses. However, it is important to know what some of those obscure diagnoses are because we know that oftentimes our patients with hand, wrist, and forearm pain um, are presenting with things like trauma from fractures, tendonitis from overuse, um, nerve compressions, and then arthritic changes as they get older but sometimes they don't always fit that mold. And so it's important to have in the back of your mind some of these other things to think about um, so that we're getting our patients the care that they need in a quickly, uh, excuse me, in a quick manner. Um, we're gonna go over a couple of these and or a few of these, excuse me, and they've got a list right there for you. Uh, and we're gonna start kind of working up higher in the neck and shoulder area and then work our way down towards the fingertips. So I'm gonna give you a few patient presentations as we go along. This is a UFC heavyweight fighter named Todd Duffy. Uh, that is a mixed martial arts um, form of entertainment and uh, a pretty grueling sport. And this was a, a patient who in his mid twenties uh, was in the prime of his career, ready to go, and then suddenly developed excruciating and debilitating pain in his shoulder and neck region that then progressed to difficulty with moving uh, and using his upper extremity. And um, this is a quote actually from him describing his, uh, his situation where he said, it felt like somebody was stabbing me in the back and I just couldn't move. I could kind of lift my shoulder, but I couldn't use my hand fully. And he talks about how he could just sort of slightly pulse it, but not completely close. He said he couldn't pick up anything with it or, or anything like that. And as you can imagine, that can be pretty devastating to a career. And this was something that he worked on with therapy um, in the absence of a prior trauma for many, many, many months. And he talks about how it took him seven weeks to learn how to rewrite. It took him two to three months of therapy before he could even start to kind of lift his shoulder, his uh, flex his elbow and really make a fist. So what is this? Whenever we're dealing with things up in the neck area, we have kind of our standard conditions that we think about things like um, shoulder pathology, we think about um, cervical um, uh, nerve impingement or even arthritis of the neck. 
We think about some of these brachial plexus injuries with stretch or trauma, but this is actually something called Parsonage Turner syndrome. It's known by multiple names, um, one of which is neuralgic amyotrophy. And it was described originally in 1948 by Parsonage and Turner and where they had a group of 136 patients that presented with this. They kind of a classic presentation that started with excruciating pain localized to the shoulder and neck area that then resolved over a period of about two weeks to a month and slowly then started developing difficulty with use of the extremity. There have been two forms that are described, idiopathic and hereditary. The idiopathic, um, they think may be an immune mediated response. There could be various triggers, uh, viral infections, immunizations, exercise, uh, perioperative or peripartum period. This can be seen following not just traumas, but also surgical procedures. And you, as you can imagine, that can make it very difficult to diagnose because the question is, well, is it because of the positioning during the surgery or is it because of the trauma that um, had happened prior to this? There's also an hereditary component, which is even more rare, which is an autosomal dominant recurrent neuropathy. And that's due to a defect in a septin family gene. What we're actually gonna be focusing on though is this kind of idiopathic form. So the incidence is a pretty, um, um, pretty minimal, two to three in, in 100,000. 30% uh, of the time it can be bilateral, but the majority of the time it's just on one side, tends to be seen more commonly in, in males and females and can present kind of people in the prime of people's lives, be starting at the age of, uh, you know, mid twenties, all the way up to 60s to 70s. And as I mentioned before, they have this acute, severe pain. And remember, neuropathic pain is different than um, your pain that may be associated with trauma or even arthritis. It's usually described as a burning, kind of smoldering, kind of shooting pain. Um, it's they often will have it in their shoulder or arm. It can last, as I mentioned, several days to weeks. And then it's followed by muscle weakness, atrophy, and sensory loss. The key with this, as compared to things like your uh, shoulder pathology or even thoracic outlet syndrome, is that it tends to be in this patchy distribution. So multiple muscles, multiple dermatomal regions tends to focus up here um, more proximally. And we can often see it in the upper brachial uh, trunks involving um, the long thoracic distribution, uh, even the phrenic nerve, and um, then going with the more distal nerves, musculocutaneous and, and axillary, we do not often see it involving the median nerve um, or even the older nerve more distally. The diagnosis is clinical and it's based on that chron chronology. So the onset of pain and then the resolution of pain then followed by weakness and atrophy. Um, common misdiagnoses, as I mentioned, are cervical disc disease and rotator cuff disease. Uh, these patients will benefit from having an EMG so that you can see, which is that nerve study, to see what's really going on. About a month after um, they've had their onset, you'll start to see sharp waves and fibrillation potentials. At three to four months, you may see even chronic denervation and then uh, some evidence of early re -innervation. Chest X-rays are usually performed to rule out space occupying lesions, such as a pancos tumor. This is an example of that in the top right hand corner. And again, remember with those, they'll often have a ptosis of the eye. They'll ha they can have meiosis um, as well as uh, uh, anhydrosis, so inability to have um, uh, sweating in that area. And that is something that does uh, require workup. So the thing to remember about these types of conditions is it doesn't mean that you don't look up the other things and you don't rule out the other things. But when those have been ruled out, you have to think about this. Now with Parsonage Turner, um, this is actually an article, uh, it's actually a Cochrane review uh, that reviewed multiple um, studies that looked at the treatment of this. Another name for it is that brachial neuritis. And what they found was that although some there is some evidence that some corticosteroids in the acute phase can shorten the time to pain, uh, there's no definitive consensus on the treatment. And basically this recovery can take months to years. On average, it's about two years. That patient that I presented earlier, the UFC fighter, it took him two years to get back to quote unquote normal, which then allowed him to go and continue his um, his training. And he, <laughs> he actually went on to do quite a bit more uh, and then had this big fight that he was gonna do, I think in 2019, 
And when he got ready to do it, he actually put his leg through a portion of the cage because he was doing some cage fighting and blew out his ACL. He then had to have that repaired, then developed an MRSA infection, and he effectively put himself into retirement. But uh, prior to that, he was ready to go after he did some pretty aggressive therapy. Um, these patients, though, have to be counseled that there may be some chronic pain and functional deficits um, in up to 30 plus percent multiple years later. And when we talk about that chronic pain, it's um, the acute excruciating pain that just keeps them from being able to do anything. It's not a relief by a positional change that, as I said before, resolves in the first couple of weeks, but there can often be this underlying chronic level of pain um, that's usually treated with our medicines like gabapentin. So we're gonna move down a little bit further. And this is a patient that had presented, 50 year old female. She had repeated episodes of pain over her elbow, radiating down to the forearm. Now you can see she is very adamantly pointing, it hurts here. She tells you repeatedly, right in this one spot. You say, okay. So when you ask her what causes it, she said, well, it's worsened by putting together my Ikea furniture, which is a um, you know, Swedish based company. Don't know if we have it in India, but over here, they do a lot of our uh, like modular um, systems where we can build some pretty high quality uh, uh, bookshelves and, and little contraptions. Um, and then also when she's tending her garden, so quite a bit of work using her forum. She does find that it gets better though with rest and she presents to you for evaluation after it's been going on for a few weeks. So as I mentioned, this is not that these things don't happen ever because this is actually lateral epicondylitis and we do see it not insignificantly, but there are other things that you have to rule out beforehand as well. This is originally described in the late 1800s as lawn tennis elbow. Uh, we tend to see it here in America as tennis elbow, and it can uh, inflict one to three percent of the population, males to females equally, and in people's uh, 30s to 50s. These patients tend to present with pain at the lateral elbow, it radiates down the forearm, and they may have some associated weakened grip and difficulty lifting items. Now, the things that you need to think about are other conditions, it's things that involve the elbow themselves, like a lateral collateral ligament, radial tunnel syndrome, which is actually very close to this area, fractures, intraarticular pathology, tendonitis of the surrounding um, big muscle groups, and you could potentially even have referred pain from cervical, shoulder, or wrist injury. So you think, well, how am I supposed to know what it, what's involved? Well, lateral epicondylitis um, tends to be localized directly over that lateral epicondyle. A common, I'm going to go back one slide, a common um, uh, similar presentation is that radial tunnel syndrome. But with radial tunnel syndrome, that's actually related to where the radial nerve as it becomes the um, posterior interosseous nerve is diving down deep. And that's about three to five centimeters distal. So I'm going to show my little elbow right here. So we've got our lateral epicondyle here and radial tunnel is going to tend to be a little bit further down. That's where you have your maximum amount of pain. And that's related to the, that nerve being compressed along various aspects of its course. So lateral epicondylitis used to be thought um, that it was pain due to active inflammation from a partial tear. Now the concern is that it's actually our ECRB, it's our extensor muscle origin, that's the problem. ECRB is the most common. And just as a reminder, ECRB inserts at the base of the third metacarpal. So it's going to be really important for, um, uh, for your extension of your wrist and even a little bit of radial um, deviation. And that will cause pretty significant discomfort for those patients on exam, when you do resisted extension of the, um, of the wrist, as well as resisted extension of the long finger, particularly with the elbow extended and even pronated, those patients will have a positive sign that let, should lead you to that diagnosis. Now, as I said before, it used to be thought that it's an inflammation, it's a lateral epicondylitis, which we associate with inflammation. But what we've now found is that studies of the vascularity, and this is um, from a study in 2002 out of clinical orthopedic related research, show that the common extensor origin shows a radial recurrent artery is the major blood supply and then the undersurface being macroscopically avascular and that's actually the area where you're having trouble so it's really not that there's um, active inflammation in the site but rather a failed reparative process so really the thought is that it's a tendinosis rather than a tendinitis and you say well okay well how does it happen 
Well, that common extensor tendon has a lot of stresses and they can lead to micro tears in that area. And then if you have any unrecognized shoulder pathology or decreased internal rotation of the shoulder, you may be using your wrist significantly and that can cause worsening of your symptoms. There is a, um, a classification that Dr. Nershall and his physical therapy colleagues put together, kind of describing the degree of lateral epicondylitis that can be utilized when um, documenting. And the reason that it's important is because that kind of tells you what we have done uh, to treat it and to have the most beneficial um, results. So we know that their lack of inflammatory cells and it's more of this tendinosis. For patients who have very mild disease, really, you know, uh, phase one through three, just a little bit of rest is all that needs to be done. When we start getting further, four and even five, then we know we've got some significant tendinosis involved. For these patients, there are multiple treatments been described. Lancet in 2002 has an article talking about corticosteroids versus physical therapy versus just wait and see. And the end result is da da da, da nothing works best. Um, so oftentimes these are treated uh, conservatively and in up to 75% even, or even greater these patients, that's all that you need. Um, now, whether you want to do just observation, or you want to do something like a wrist splint to keep them from having to do excessive wrist motion, um, occupational therapy, which involves um, some massage and stretching and gliding exercise, or even steroid injections, that's up to each individual provider. I will say that in our practice um, at the VA hospital, um, because I split my time half between pediatric hand surgery and the other half um, between adults. On the adult side, when we tend to see this, Usually we are giving um, steroid injections. Now, we know that in theory, since it's not an active inflammatory process, the steroid sh shouldn't really help, but it does in some of these patients. And I would say in our patient population, greater than 50%. But then again, this also tends to improve with just a, a watch and wait policy. Um, and as you can see in this group, they had 185 patients at a year follow-up, 83% improved with observation, um, or in the observation group, 83% improved. And that was actually better than the injection, eh, a little bit comparable to the physical therapy, um, but sometimes it just kind of um, dies out. Now, if you have a patient that has not had any improvement in six months to a year, then we start talking about operative intervention, particularly if these conservative measures that have been um, attempted have not worked. One other thing that people tend to do is they put this brace across right here. We actually tend to avoid that very, very um, dramatically in, in our group. And that is because oftentimes patients are really uncomfortable and they think, okay, if I put a little bit of pressure, that'll help. And then they say, okay, well, if I put a little bit more pressure with that brace, and again, it's a strap that's going on, the thought being that we're keeping that muscle off from moving back and forth. But you can actually, as you remember, I mentioned the radial tunnel is really close there. And if you put too much pressure, you may end up with a patient who all of a sudden can't lift their wrist, can't lift their fingers, can't lift their thumb. And now you've given yourself a PIN palsy. Not a good plan. We don't want to do that to our patients who came in for something else. And so we try to counsel our patients to avoid doing that. So operative treatments can um, vary. There are multiple ways that this can be done. Some people release or lengthen the common, common extensor origin. I think more importantly, this debridement to the pathological tissue, and this is just um, some photos showing kind of right down into that area, the maximum point of tenderness, getting down, and you actually get below this area and almost scrape it back and forth, trying to trigger a, um, a healing process, and then also debrid some of this fibrous tissue. You can, if you need to perform an enconius rotation, um, de decompression of the um, posterior neurosis nerve can be performed, but very rarely is it needed. And then uh, in extreme cases, denervation of the lateral epicondyle. So let's move down just a little bit. This is actually a patient that I saw in our um, uh, VA clinic, and I've seen this a couple of times since then. So this is a 23-year-old right-hand dominant male. He's a veteran. He just recently returned from active duty, and he has right radial-sided volar wrist pain, so right along this area. His symptoms occur with push-ups and repeated lifting of heavy bags overhead and loading them into the trucks. Now, of course, we're going to check to see, is he having trouble with his first dorsal compartment with the Decker veins uh, tendonitis? Is he having trouble 
for some reason with him CMC joint? Did he have an undiagnosed trauma that has then um, started to heal and now has caused an irregularity of the, um, of the bony surface? And we even uh, think about when we're talking about radial sided pain and difficulty, uh, think about carpal tunnel, because sometimes that can present with this kind of aching palmar pain um, that is very close to where he's talking about. We did all that work up and it wasn't um, giving us a diagnosis. Well, this patient actually presented with something called FCR tendinitis fairly uncommon source of pain, first described by Winterstein in 1930 in a very um, detailed and yet German article that I cannot translate. However, it has also been referred to um, by other articles, and this is, in, this is some data actually out of an article in the Hand Journal in 2015, talking about a simple blind tenolysis for FCR tendinopathy. Um, these patients can present with uh, uh, pain with repetitive wrist flexion, golfers, racquetball or squash players. Um, and in our case, this is a veteran who had been uh, using the hand significantly during his active duty and then um, had translated over into his um, at home uh, activities. This condition is a primary stenosing tenosynovitis within the tunnel of the, uh, that the FCR sits in. And that's what this picture is showing you right over here at the level of the trapezium and the trapezoid, just right near the scaphoid. Um, it could also be a uh, secondary tendonitis associated with a scaphoid fracture. If you have a cyst in the area, even a distal radius fracture or significant arthritis. So I, you may even see this in your older patient population. So one group um, that they tend to see a little bit more frequently is in our fairly thin, older uh, female populations with significant arthritis. Again, thumb CMC and STT arthritis. These patients um, can benefit from having a couple of different diagnos uh, diagnostic maneuvers and studies, depending on what you have available. If you have an MRI, it's always helpful to um, be able to see what's going on. Remember, an MRI is going to be used for our soft tissue as well as some of our bony uh, uh, pathology, and it can let us know if there is um, inflammation around a tendon as well as whether there's a space occupying lesion like a cyst. Um, the T2 image is what it shows up best on, and this is an example with that arrow showing you right around that FCR tendon. Additionally, in the clinic setting, uh, just a diagnostic injection with a local anesthetic along the sheath can be very effective and very simple. And for these patients, and in this patient in particular, basically found the point of maximum tenderness uh, dotted along that area because it did radiate and then just put 1% lidocaine and took, I think it was about uh, maybe two cc's total and just injected along that area. And just like that, symptoms went away, which can be very diagnostic. So just a little bit on the anatomy of the SCR uh, tendon. So it's a bipennate muscle. The tendon is enveloped by a sheath from the musculotendinous junction, which is down here, all the way up to here, right where it's um, just past the distal scaphoid tubercle. Um, that tunnel is at the proximal border of the trapezium is less than two centimeters in length. And you can have a significant amount of trouble there. The insertion of the tendon is onto the second and the third metacarpal. There is a very small slip that goes onto the trapezial crest, but the majority, again, um, are going to go past that. So you can imagine this can create an area of uh, compression and irritation. The first line of treatment for these patients is going to be conservative. Um, that article that I had mentioned that was in the hand journal um, from 2015 actually has a very nice algorithm to follow, which basically says the first line of treatment is going to be splinting. And in our practice, because we want to get them better as quickly as possible, we will often do a steroid injection at the same time. And you're splinting the wrist to keep it from flexing, keep it from radially deviating, and then of course, keeping it from extending, which can cause some stretch across that area and irritation. And we usually tell them to do this for up to four weeks. Now, depending on their line of work or their activities, you know, they may or may not be able to do, um, uh, to be, uh, 100% compliant. In general, what I tell people if for something like this is we want to try and do it as much as possible. That includes sleeping at night because a lot of people think, well, if I'm sleeping, I'm not moving. And my counter argument to them is when you're sleeping, that is in theory, six to eight hours, depending on your schedule of uninterrupted therapy, which would be immobilization. And so if you have that opportunity, why not take it? I usually tell them to keep their splint on at all times, except for washing their hands and showering. The thought being that 
they'll be a little bit more compliant if I at least say, okay, you can take it off for the shower. Surgical treatment when this has failed um, is usually involving a volar approach. When it was first described, um, they originally described it using an, uh, a carpal tunnel approach and then actually going through the retinaculum to attack to, to attack it, uh, to um, access that area. Uh, but you could also just do this volar approach and release kind of directly on top of it. And that's where this example is showing here, kind of going up and over the thenar eminence. Um, and then you're gonna release the, the tendon sheath distally to the ulnar border of the trapezial crest. And you wanna verify that you've released it by mobilizing it from the trapezial groove. Now there's very limited um, space in there and there's just a couple of millimeters really before it's uh, surrounded on all sides. And so if you do not release that, you um, have a higher chance of having residual symptoms for these patients. Moving down a bit further, this is a patient uh, presentation, a 36 year old uh, climber who presented with a gradual onset of wrist pain over several days while climbing in the Himalayas. She was um, doing a combination of ice and rock and had to use um, this technical ice ax. And so um, in case you don't know what a technical ice ax is, because I certainly didn't know, uh, this is a picture of it up on the top. And this is a picture of a person holding that, um, that ice ax. The air where she was having her pain, which was over the dorsal radial wrist, about five centimeters proximal to Lister's tubercle. And that was after she had used the ax. When she stopped using it, it got better. When she started using it again, she started having pain. Now, this is in a very close proximity to another very common condition that we see, which is Decker veins, tenosynovitis. And as a reminder, with Decker veins, that's um, uh, compression and irritation with, of the APL and the EPB tendon within the first dorsal compartment. But there's something important that goes on right here, and that leads us to intersection syndrome. So intersection syndrome was um, first described in the mid 1800s. One of the largest studies was actually in the 1950s with over 400 patients. Um, they've called it multiple things, APL bursitis, crossover tendonitis, peritendinitis, crepitans, all very impressive sounding, but basically we say intersection syndrome because the area where they're having the most discomfort usually corresponds anatomically to where the um, tendons of the first or the muscle bellies of the first dorsal compartment are crossing over the tendons of the second dorsal compartment, which has ECRL and ECRB in it. This is seen with repetitive wrist extension. Uh, Weightlifters and rowers are the common uh, patients that present. And occasionally, as uh, that patient was described, and ISAX uh, users. Um, the pain, as I mentioned before, is approximately four to five centimeters proximal to the wrist crease. You can have swelling, crepitus, and even occasional redness in that area. So what is going on in that spot? This is just an anatomical picture kind of showing that area. And when these patients present, they will actually often present with a bit of swelling right over here, which corresponds to... I can do it kind of right in this area, a bit of fullness, even some crepitus in that spot. And again, that's where the muscle bellies are going over the tendons. Um, if they're, these patients will have nonspecific thickening in that area. They may have some adhesions. If you were to do a histological evaluation, you'd see fibrocyte proliferation in the tenosynovium. Oftentimes it's more of a chronic presentation and it can also be seen with um, Decker veins. So they may even have that Finkelstein's test. And remember Finkelstein's, we put our thumb down. Usually if you try and grab and pull, it hurts everybody. So I always tell people to do their own. So thumb goes down, thumb, um, fingers crossed, class around it, and then they ulnarly deviate and they'll, they'll let you know if they're having pain directly over the radial styloid. That's usually indicative of Decker veins. Now they may also have inflammation there in association with this, but this tends to be seen when they've been having those symptoms for quite a while. Uh, prior to 1985, the belief was that the pathology was where the muscle bellies cross at the tendons. But what we've actually seen, and this was, um, uh, a study that was uh, done back in 1985 in the journal Hand Surgery um, was that these patients um, actually have issues more with the second compartment itself. And so it's not enough to just open up down here into that actual intersection. You really need to release a bit of that synovial sheath uh, along the second um, compartment. 
Treatment is usually conservative. Uh, 60 plus percent um, will respond with this. Um, I usually mobilize with the wrist and the thumb. It's not enough just to do the wrist because remember, we've also got oft, often have some uh, combining uh, symptoms associated with the first dorsal compartment. Anti-inflammatory steroid injections, um, we find are very, very effective. And when I say NSAIDs, I know particular orthopedic surgeons um, tend to, you have kind of, everybody has their, their, um, their set amount that they do. Um, I will say that in, in my practice, I find it's most helpful for somebody to have naproxen or something um, equivalent, which is a little bit of a longer acting anti-inflammatory as compared to like ibuprofen. And I tell them to take it um, every morning. And sometimes if it's pretty severe, I'll say one tablet in the morning, cause it's over the counter for us here. One tablet in the morning, one tablet in the evening and do that for a two week course. So two weeks is kind of my magic time period. That's also when I tell them they need to have their um, splint on and again, wearing it as much as possible except for showering and washing their hands. And we know that these patients tend to do fairly well. However, if you do need to go on and have surgical intervention, um, you have to incise over the juncture of the first and second compartments, make sure that you elevate the APL and EPB muscle values, but more importantly, you have to release that second compartment sheath. With those, if you do this, you can end up with 100% response. And this is just um, an illustration showing that hypertrophic synovium over that site. So something to keep in mind. Moving down a little bit further, we have a 25 year old new carpenter who noted difficulty independently flexing his thumb and his index finger while handling the screws in his work. He had just started um, in his new career as a carpenter and was having particular trouble trying to uh, twist that screwdriver. This is associated for him with pain in the volar wrist as well as in the forearm. Well, all common things being common, we always think about our um, tendonitis. Now that we know about FCR tendonitis, we always we also think about that as well. But this is a patient where their diagnosis is most notable on their exam. So this is called Lindbergh Comstock syndrome. We do not see it very often as far as a symptomatic diagnosis. However, it is not uncommon in the population to a varying degree. And this is a common question that we ask our residents and our fellows as kind of a, uh, um, a question in conference and then uh, can even present on our, our boards. So Lindbergh Comstock syndrome is a symptomatic restrictive thumb index finger flexor tenosynovitis. It was originally described by its namesakes in 1979 as a clinical syndrome. And they had um, a study where they looked at 194 patients and looked at bilateral uh, extremities. 31% had the anomaly of at least one extremity. Um, prior to this, there had been some tendon slips uh, as a, uh, and sorry for that typo, there should be FPL, not FLP, to the FDP. Um, they've been reported, but no mention of clinical significance. Well, these patients will present with pain in the palmar aspect of the hand, the wrist, and even the distal forearm. Sometimes they will have some median nerve paresthesias, but more commonly they'll have um, that pain. And it's aggravated, aggravated excuse me, by repetitive or continuous use of the hand while working or riding. Um, the diagnostic test is pain in the distal forearm with passive extension of the index finger while um, the thumb is flexed. And what you'll actually see is this picture down here on the bottom, they will start to flex your finger. And this is the point in the, uh, in the talk when everybody in the audience uh, discreetly looks down at their hand and they're like, well, if I extend my index finger and I move my thumb, what does that do? And you'll find that on some patients, when you do that, it'll actually make your index finger wiggle a little bit because there might be a little connection. So there are three anatomical variations seen. Um, there's a well, you can have a well-defined tendon, um, tendon connection, excuse me. You can have a bifid FPL muscle with an anomalous muscle belly inserting into um, one of the adjacent tendons, um, or you may have no demonstrable anomaly, but there's persistent dense flexor tenosynovial adhesions that prevent um, independent excursion. And those patients I think may have been related to some sort of trauma prior. And that can happen in um, a, a good proportion of them as compared to this uh, well-defined tendon um, connection. So treatment for these, if they are symptomatic, is gonna be surgical excision of anomaly in, the, in a tenosynovectomy, so um, removing that area. And so these are just some examples. Um, this is showing that tendon, tendinous insertion or um, 
uh, tendinous connection between the two. Uh, this is just little bands going across and these are the fibrous bands. Uh, so just examples of the, um, uh, of the presentations that we talked about. So let's talk about another patient. We had a 40 year old female who had a crush injury about four years ago to a very, very large weight falling onto the ulnar aspect of her hand. And she presents with pretty significant pain in the fourth web space and very um, limited motion of her ring and small finger, particularly with inability to fully extend um, the IP joints right up here, or excuse me, PIP joints with the MCPs in extension that causes pain. And additionally, with repetitive gripping, she has pain. Um, and so she now has her hands primarily, those fingers sitting in a flexed and flexed position at the MCP and PIP joints. Now, of course, you're going to ask her about um, any sort of ulnar nerve issues. You're going to ask about any trauma. And she may not have remembered that she had this big crush injury. I will tell you that in our practice, oftentimes, you're like, oh, it's been going on for a little while or, oh, I, I, don't, I don't know. And then when you start asking them and trying to tease out a little bit more of information, they'll be like, oh, well, there actually was that one time that I had something happened. And, and my question, my follow-up question is, did it require a trip to the emergency room? Did it require any intervention? Because that kind of lets me know if it was significant enough. So this is a patient that presents with something called a saddle deformity. Do not see this often. However, it can be seen. Uh, it's actually a post-traumatic interosseous and lumbar coal adhesion. So an anomalous connection between those two that usually results uh, following a trauma. Um, you'll usually see it along the radial aspect of the long, the ring and the small fingers, and that has to do with the anatomy of the intrinsic muscles. And that these patients will have distal intermetacarpal space pain. So that's basically talking about this area right up in here. Um, during intrinsic contraction, remember this is your intrinsic plus position, this is what it's trying to do. And when they have prolonged gripping, and that's due to impingement on the deep transverse metacarpal ligament. This is a picture down here illustrating that. And there's, there's, there's your transverse metacarpal ligament. This is your interosseous muscle, muscle excuse me, a volar interosseous muscle. Um, this is the dorsal aspect of the metacarpal and the volar aspect. And then here's your lumbrical. And so with these patients, they have an anomalous connection between here. Um, this is a study um, out of the general hand surgery from back in 1986, where they had 87 cases, but that was over a 17 year period uh, in which they presented with this. So just as a reminder with the normal anatomy, the second, third, and fourth lumbar coals pass along the radial side of the fingers volar to the deep transverse metacarpal ligament before inserting onto the external extensor hood. Now, the second dorsal and second and third palmar interosseous muscles pass dorsal to that and insert onto the base of the proximal phalanx in the hood. So it's a setup for potential disaster if you have a significant enough trauma. This junction within the extensor hood slides proximally during intrinsic contraction. So if you have a significant amount of scarring, you cause pain or lightning bolts as we see down here. Um, those adhesions are forming between the bellies or tendons and this impinges on the ligament during contraction. It actually limits excursion proximally, and you can even see adhesions um, of the tendons to the uh, joint capsule directly. And that's what that picture on the right-hand side is showing. So when you're trying to extend the MCP, you're getting that tightness there, whereas this is the classic um, presentation in the center where you're trying to do the intrinsic plus um, uh, position. These patients, if you do a Benell test to check for intrinsic tightness, will have significant pain and tightness that keeps them from being able to um, flex the IP joints with their MCPs extended. The etiology is often due to that diffuse crush injury, as we mentioned, and you may not see anything right away, and then slowly it will start to develop. They have tenderness at that space, worsen with repetitive grip, and then pain with passive or active digital deviation. So with these, we often treat these with lysis or removal of the adhesions, and that's to allow for excursion um, and early mobilization is key here. The nice thing is in 87% of the patients, you're going to have improvement just like that. Um, so again, not very common, but something to think about when you've kind of ruled out other things. All right, we're almost done. I've just got a couple more cases to show you guys. So um, this is, and I unfortunately don't have a patient presentation for this one. I'm just going to tell you about it, but thumb sesamoiditis. So 
These are patients who present with pain in the thumb at the MCP joint. And, and our adult patient population, particularly at the VA, we often have patients who have uh, pain and the thumb. Usually it's the thumb base because we know the CMC arthritis is the most common location to have um, arthritis in the hand, but also at the MCP joint. So the question is what's causing the trouble there? Is it the MCP joint itself, the junction of the metacarpal and the base of the phalanx, or is it something else? So think about patients who may develop tenderness, um, synovitis, and even kind of a grating sensation. And it's elicited by flexing the MCP joint, applying pressure to the sesamoid, and then passively extending. So these patients, you're basically grinding across the sesamoid bones themselves. Um, in 1985, Trumbull and his group described um, in the Journal of Hand Surgery, the evaluation and treatment of post-traumatic sesamoid arthritis of the thumb joint in 36 patients. So again, not a lot of patients present with this, but I would suggest that we have quite a few who on x-ray do have um, some arthritis involving the uh, sesamoid, um, that little joint that's in there. Um, and it's definitely warrants looking at your x-ray and zooming in a little bit if you have the capability. So on radiographic evaluation, um, the radial and ulnar sesamoids are embedded in the uh, volar plate. Um, the anatomy of the joint is such that the radial sesamoid is more predisposed to arthritic changes. And this is showing this examination kind of a cross section here. Um, the arthritis can develop between the sesamoid and the metacarpal condyle following a ligamentous injury. Um, so something to think about. Treatment is most of the time gonna be conservative. It's a, a strategically placed steroid injection, of course, avoiding injury to the adjacent digital nerves and vessels. Um, and splinting can be successful, as I said, in about 70% of those patients. When that doesn't help, the uh, surgical intervention with the sesamoidectomy uh, via a palmar transverse incision can be performed. And that's what this is showing. This is showing our tendon, this is showing our sesamoid down here. Um, we have occasionally had to do this in our practice where we go in and remove that sesamoid, but most of the time, just treating it with the um, um, conservative route is the easiest and uh, most beneficial to our patient. Okay, one more patient for you. So this is a, um, condition that we actually all should know. Um, we don't often see it, but it's uh, significant enough that um, most people can recognize it on an exam. These patients present with uh, a cold hypersensitivity and significant pain um, when they have their finger placed in cold water and pinpoint pain in the finger. It's not just a global, it's not it hurts here and all the way down here, it is right here that it is hurting. These symptoms are brought on by pressure, cold exposure, and they tend to be seen as well at nighttime. They can have bluish or purplish discoloration at the sites. And this is a picture showing right where this patient is having an issue. And I would suggest to you that anytime you see any sort of lesion, whether it is painful or not, and it has been there for a not insignificant period of time, um, in an adult patient population, it always warrants a biopsy because we have seen um, uh, cancers, whether they're metastatic or um, or primary uh, developing underneath the nail and it can be hidden um, from view until you actually uh, take that uh, tissue for your diagnosis. And that for us involves removing the nail plate and then taking out the tissue. Um, and we don't do a significant amount of um, any sort of reconstruction until we have an actual diagnosis because we have unfortunately um, diagnosed squamous cell as well as melanoma um, this way. And remember right underneath your nail bed is your distal phalanx. Um, and so you've got a very, very close proximity to the periosteum and to bone right there. So glomus tumors is what this patient has. Glomus body is a contractile neuromyer arterial receptor that controls blood pressure and temperature by regulating the peripheral blood flow through an um, arterial venous shunt first described in the early, early 1800s. And they're present in the dermis throughout the body, but concentrated in the digital subungual or below the nail region. And that's why we will often see them present um, with uh, nail bed pain. I would say the most common presentation is that excruciating pain when applied pressure or cold. Um, for these, the diagnosis is primarily clinical. Um, there are multiple tests that you can do. I've actually never done the J test, which is where pain can spread to your shoulder. Um, 
the love pin test, which is pain with palpation over the overlying skin with a pinhead, ballpoint pen, or even paperclip. Um, the cold sensitivity, though, as soon as you put it in cold water, that causes the pain. That's usually diagnostic for us. Treatment for these is going to be surgical excision. Um, this uh, this picture right here is showing you where the nail bed, um, proximal nail fold has had relaxing incisions placed on the lateral aspects. And it is pulled back so that you can uh, adequately visualize the nail bed itself. This was the tumor. It was actually right over here in this area. And so it's actually, it's been lifted up, excised and set down right here. Um, and this will usually just be closed primarily. Um, you can do a little bit of undermining with a little blade so that it can move. The nice thing is that unlike a trauma nail bed laceration, this tissue will move um, pretty nicely across as a sheet. Um, and then recurrence rate though is still one to 18%. And they see, feel that's often, uh, if it does occur, is due to incomplete excision. Um, the key here is always, if you have the opportunity and you have the capability, always, always, always send your dye, your tissue for pathology. Um, and that's with this, but it's also true with other conditions, even um, ganglion, uh, ganglion cysts. We have had patients with, um, what looks like and acts like just a regular dorsal wrist ganglion cyst on the back part of the wrist. You send it off and it ended up being a synovial sarcoma. It happens often enough that I will always, always, always send it. So something to think about. So that is actually kind of a whirlwind tour of the upper extremity, what we call our zebras or more obscure causes of hand pain and upper extremity pain, things to keep in the back of your mind, um, you know, just in case you need to have, uh, if you're getting stalled out on your exam or your treatment. Um, I actually listed my email address down here. So if there's any questions or anybody has anything they'd like to discuss or a follow up, feel free to reach out via email. I'm always happy to answer. Thank you, Jen, uh, for a very fantastic presentation. You've covered the entire gamut of all the problems that could happen. I'm still, I'm sure there are still more conditions there. There are. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Jen, can you stop sharing your screen if you don't mind? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Jen, a couple of questions. Now, you mentioned about tendinitis, right? FCR tendinitis. Mm -hmm. And what about the other tendinitis? Because FCU, ECU, any of these tendons could be inflamed, right? And what is the most common one? Is it the FCR that is the most common? Well, so FCR is going to be important when we're talking about um, tendinitis where we have inflammation within the tunnel because it's often not relieved by just... Um, just doing whether like you're doing a, a steroid injection down here or even the brace um, because there can be pathology, right? That's um, causing irritation right there in that very tight canal. I would say for us, um, ECU is one of the most common ones that we see. Um, and that's going to be, you know, uh, pain and inflammation stuff along here, along the dorsal aspect. And for that, we usually treat with the mobilization and the, um, the steroid injection. Um, and the FCU we see, but I don't know. I don't see it. I don't see that as, as often as a, um, as the ECU. Thank you, Jen. And nowadays, most of the, uh, I mean, young people, they are most of the time on their phones. And do you think there's a possibility for a repetitive stress injury? Someone has yes. described a condition called as WhatsAppitis, <laughs> isn't it? Yes. So, and so remember, I mentioned the other half of my practice is pediatric hand. And I will tell you that we are seeing more and more, particularly with, um, you know, COVID, where everybody has been in quarantine and have it basically a year where you've been uh, more isolated, um, spending a lot more time on the phone. And we'll have patients um, come in with repetitive, in, um, repetitive, like almost like a tendonitis. I think it actually has more to do what we see is in the thumb. Um, and so what I will do when I have patients present, they just say, cause what they'll do is they'll come in, they'll say, it hurts. It hurts everywhere when I do things. I'm like, okay, well, let's talk about all the different things that you're actually doing. And then I will literally walk them through activities and especially in the teenagers where they'll sit there and like roll their eyes at you. And you say, okay, I, I really do have a reason for this. The reason being, I'm trying to find out what type of maneuvers really trigger it the most so that we can identify the problem with the anatomy. And when I say that they, um, they will often say, oh, okay, well that, that makes more sense. And so you know, we talk about, um, you know, thumb base arthritis being one of the most common things for an adult. And those patients will sometimes present to us at the VA hospital. They'll say, I have pain, I have pain right here. And when they're telling me about how 
how the pain presents, I will usually walk through things like, can you pick up a cuff? Is, do you have a problem? Like when you pick up a coffee cup and they'll say, well, I can pick it up, but then I can't hold it. And I have to set it down. And that's, that's a key thing. That's CMC arthritis almost always. And so what about turning a lock and a key or, uh, or turning, you know, like, yeah, or excuse me, turning a key and a lock or even like starting a car or things like that. And they say, oh, that actually does do it. And it's that pinching, that gripping that then translates that pain down to here. So for um, the patients who have, uh, this kind of tendonitis usually involving the thumb, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say that I've seen it say, oh, it must be FPL tendonitis. If anything, I'd say they probably have more difficulty with the extension because they're, you know, it's like they're pushing down that, that doesn't require a lot of work. It's this lifting up that that's repetitive over and over. Um, and so I will actually have them hold their phone and say, okay, well, when you touch the phone or when you're doing that, what is it? And you'll watch them. And as they're doing it, they'll say, oh, right there, right there. That's what causes it. So we tend to see that. And again, with those, I usually have them be aware of it. Uh, we do um, uh, splinting for comfort. Uh, and again, talking about that, you know, just without washing and, and showering, but otherwise keeping it on. And then the, I think the NSAID course is important. And the, re the reason I tell them that to use anti-inflammatories is I remind them, it's like, we're not, I'm not trying to treat the pain when I'm doing this. I'm trying to stop the inflammatory cascade. And so what I want you to do is take it, you know, once in the morning and or once in the evening for this period of time, because we're trying to stop all those little mediators. I'm not trying to quote unquote, treat your pain with that. Um, and I think that sometimes having that little bit of education for our patients helps with compliance <laughs> because they, they understand it's not just the doctor telling me, oh, do something. It's like, this is why we're doing it. Um, the other thing that we do is, um, so we tend to see uh, as well, and again, in, and this is a little bit more in pediatric, but whenever school starts back up, um, they will do a lot of writing and they'll complain of cramping in their hand, particularly like in the first web space, and then pain um, with grip kind of right here at this, um, right at the thenars. And uh, for those patients, you know, they've had for us usually a summer where they haven't been doing anything. And now they're getting back into significant um, uh, use and uh, re repetitive motion and a lot of tight gripping and they'll get uh, leading to that pain. And so for them, we'll do um, counseling on how to hold your pen, which you wouldn't think you'd have to do. But I, then you watch these kids sometimes and they're like, what? holding their pen like that, like, what are you doing? Uh, and then the other thing is um, we will actually have people, cause I have this with adults too. You get the little, it's like a silicone piece or you can even use you know tape and build it up so that you're not gripping so tightly and it's now spread out a little bit. So a little bit of a spacer. So those activity um, of daily living modifications. And that's where I think having um, a hand therapist or, or an occupational therapist available um, for, for um, uh, communication with your patient, but also with you just to kind of, because they're very, very creative people and they have a lot of tricks that we as surgeons don't know about. Um, and so I think communicating with them can actually help give you some really good ideas to, to treat that. Thank you, Jen, for that. And the other common uh, scenario is, again, when you talked about uh, repetitive stress injury, and you mentioned about a lady who was going up the Himalayas. And what about, there's a uh, condition called as a hypothenar hammer syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Due to repetitive vibratory tool usage or something like that? Yes. Yeah. So that, uh, I mean, you could see it with that, but I would say that for um, for something like that, like holding, holding an axe, uh, they're it's not going to be as tight right there because the ax actually goes down and kind of grips around. That is more of a repetitive hitting. So for us, the classic example, though, I don't feel like we see this as the actual example anymore, would be somebody using a jackhammer where they have their hands like this. And it's the constant repetitive vibration because basically with the hypothalamus, hypothenar hammer syndrome, you have trauma to the arteri um, to the artery. And then you get this like aneurysm that can develop in here or even clotting off. Uh, and when you have that, that's going to be a significant, um, that's a significant treatment because you basically have to often excise that and reconstruct with um, an arterial uh, a graft. Um, those patients will not operate on until we have an MRI um, so that you can actually evaluate that better. Thank you, Jen, for that. And Sintel is also in a Zoom room. Sintel, Sintel is a staff orthopedic surgeon based in Texas for the, I mean, interest of audience. And Sintel, your questions to Jen. Uh, Dr. Cargill, it's a great presentation. Uh, 
you know, like this is going to really help the residents, especially those topics where they don't want to sit and read. But I'm surprised that he included <laughs> Latin epicondylitis in the zebra. I thought it's an arse, you know. So. I know, I know. It's it's not that it's, that's why I, I prefaced it by saying it's not terribly uncommon, but I think it's important. You know, what I really should have done is done a radial, I should put a radial tunnel in there because radial tunnels actually a little, you know, not as common, but it's a little bit further and it's more mm-hmm. of a, a talking point to discuss between the two of them. Um, but lateral epicondylitis, although I think we see it a lot, I, I feel like a lot of people treat it, as I said, you know, with the, uh, the steroid injection or they'll do the, um, uh, you know, the strap, that counter counter brace. And it's, it's not very effective. So I think it's an important thing to discuss, which is why I kept it in there. <laughs> so the other thing is like, what's your, uh, uh, opinion about PRP. Do you use PRP? I do not. Um, I think that, uh, and, and it's not covered as far as I know, it's not covered by insurance. Um, and okay. so I, I find that, uh, things like that, where the literature does not support it, um, with a significant impact. Um, I just don't use that particularly since they do, they honestly do better with just nothing, uh, with observation. You know, the, the reason I'm asking is with PRP, it, it's the role is limited in a lot of other conditions, but uh, lateral epicondylitis is one that's showing slightly favorable results. And these are the mm-hmm. patients who are very frustrated because of a chronic mm-hmm. chronicity and they're kind of at the end of the rope. So um, I, I, I've always been thinking about it in my practice, but I, I never jumped on it because, you know, like it's a lot of hassle associated with the, yep. you know, a lot. Yeah, it is. Yeah, uh-huh. it is. And and I've known uh, of people who use it, but I will say that anecdotally, those patients are like, I mean, I guess it was fine. <laughs> you uh-huh. know? And so for me, um, the other thing that you can be do that you can do, and I didn't have it listed on there, but when we talk about surgeries, you can actually do that percutaneous um uh, treatment, which, uh, say, sorry, I'm left-handed, so I'm going to hold up my right hand. So basically you take your knee, you get right down that spot, but you're almost taking a, like an 18 gauge needle and you're putting it fairly deep and almost like scraping it across it again, trying to, in theory, um, trigger a healing response and just kind of scraping up on that area. So that is another treatment that I would honestly try before I would try, you know, PRP. Uh-huh. But I understand and, uh, like the, the, why it's supposed to be helpful. The other thing is uh, uh, regarding the hand condition below the wrist when they come out with the non-specific hand pain, how often do you end up asking for an MRI? Do you, because very often it's like so small that you can't find much, right? Right, right. So I, so if I, if I need to, I will uh, ask for an MRI. And you actually can see a significant amount of um, uh, pathology, um, even you know in the fingers. With, uh, but I usually get an MRI with and without contrast because I want to see if there are any little ganglions or, and I want to be able to see those vessels light up. Um, for the most part, because again, common things being common. We don't need to do that because you can usually diagnose it with your clinical tools and your x-rays. But whenever I have a, a mass, um, particularly at, at the VA, because some of these patients will present, you know, they've been dealing with this for a little while and they're like, yeah, it's kind of right there. And then you look and it's actually feels like it's not as well circumscribed and it's kind of deep and going down in, you know, in between here, I'll get an MRI. And some of that is for diagnosis, but more importantly, it's to guide with surgery so that I know what to expect in my going to need to do a nerve graft? Am I going to be thinking about doing something that's involving the joint, um, debridement involving the tendons? Is it going to be wrapping around so then I need to plan for two incisions, that sort of thing. And regarding the Parsonage Turner syndrome, do they mm-hmm. always have sensory symptoms? Because I've seen a couple of patients, they never, did not have any sensory symptoms. They had pain. Mm-hmm. No, 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 pain. Um, and so, and it's, it's, uh, intermittent and it's not always the exact symptoms. So it's not, you know, the patient where they're going to have weakness here, here, and here. It, it's very patchy. That's the whole point of it. And, but the key with the diagnosis is that excruciating pain that then goes away and then you get the muscle um, and you get the movement issues. So sensory some, but more, more, it's actually motor. Okay. That's right. Yeah. But the, one, of, yeah the, one of the patient was actually uh, staff in my hospital I worked in and he came in saying that he's not able to lift and he's got pain but no tenderness and he had winging or scapula and mm-hmm. uh, you know things like that so yeah so yeah and the interesting thing about that is two years like 
on average before, but they do, but they can often get better, you know, with, with, even if you didn't really do very much, it's just, you got to get them through that first period of time. And then uh, a little bit of physical therapy, but not so much uh, the physical therapy I feel is more to just kind of keep motion and range in your joints, you know, rather than trying to restore something right away. And when do you get MRA for lateral epicondylitis? After six weeks, after three months? Yeah, because I've seen a couple of patients. After a point, you know, like, uh, yeah, I've had like uh, patients, a couple of patients who had a, a lipoma around the pin and one ended mm -hmm. up having an excision and things like that. So uh, diffuse intramuscular lipomas and things like that. So do you uh, at all get it at some point after like uh, treating them just to make sure there is uh, so nothing else going on? Well, if it, if it's been a, honestly, if it's been a few months and they've had the treatment, but mo because most of them actually do like having the serot injection. Um, and again, if you do that serot injection, you got to get that knee. It's not, you know, right up here. You got to get down deep where you're almost hitting, where you're basically hitting bone for it to, in my opinion, um, have any sort of effect. Um, but most of those patients, since they're going to be improving before, prior to that, I don't need to, if it was over a few months, so anywhere past, I'd say probably three to six months, I would probably get that just to see what's going on. But having said that, I would look at my other exam points. So again, looking at the radial tunnel and kind of making sure that I've excluded those as a possible option. And, and actually, if I am thinking about radial tunnel, I will get an MRI. I actually get an MR neurography so I can follow the nerve. That's great. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. Thank you very much. It was a great uh, presentation. Jen, can we take a question from the audience? I mean, it's a sure. big, long, long presentation. I know that you're, I mean, it's pretty, it's almost an hour. Okay. Just one last question from the audience. So one Dr. Kumar wants to know, what are the chances of a tendon tear by giving a steroid injection? Ah, so the literature suggests that um, if you're giving uh, tendon, or excuse me, if you're giving injections, um, you really should be limiting it. Um, so we will have some people come in who have had multiple injections at outside facilities in general, like for things like for trigger finger stuff, we will do a couple of rounds and that's it. If you haven't had improvement after about two rounds, a couple things. One, there's a risk, a significant risk of uh, tendon uh, attrition, right? And then rupture, which is not a, just a quick and easy, take one in and put the other end back together. Now you've got thinning and now you're, now you're talking about, am I gonna have to do some sort of tendon graft like to weave in between? Um, but also if it didn't improve after two rounds, why would you do it again? You know, it's like, it's understandable in my opinion to do, um, to, to do an injection. Uh, the classic example that we do is like a, a trigger finger, right? We'll do two rounds of trigger fingers, about six to eight weeks apart. And if they still have not had improvement, they still have symptoms, then we usually just go in. The surgical intervention is pretty minimal. It's a small incision. The downtime is low and we just take care of it and it's, it's cured. It's, it's fixed. Um, but this is not, and I, I counsel patients that this is not like arthritis where we're talking about doing maintenance steroid injections down into a joint. The purpose for the most part with these is to, to treat slash cure, not to maintain. Um, and so if it's not working after a couple of rounds, we don't do it again because there, there is definitely a risk of the um, tendon rupture. Thank you, Jen. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Fantastic lecture. And I'm sure this lecture is going to benefit thousands of people all over the world. Thank you so much for joining in, Jen. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciated the opportunity. Thank you, Sentinel.